Chapter Thirteen of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Thirteen. When the weather began to clear up, Mary sometimes rode out alone, purposely to view the ruins that still remain of the earthquake, or she would ride to the banks of the Tagus, to feast her eyes at the sight of the magnificent river. At other times she would visit the churches, as she was particularly fond of seeing historical paintings. One of these visits gave rise to the subject, and the whole party descanted on it. But as the ladies could not handle it well, they soon adverted to portraits, and talk of the attitudes and characters in which they should wish to be drawn. Mary did not fix on one, when Henry, with a more apparent warmth than usual, said, I would give the world for a picture, with the expression I have seen in face, when you have been supporting your friend. This delicate compliment did not gratify her vanity, but it reached her heart. She then recollected that she had once sat for a picture. For whom was it designed? For a boy? Her cheeks flushed in indignation. So strongly did she feel an emotion of contempt at having been thrown away, given in with an estate. As Mary again gave way to hope, her mind was more disengaged, and her thoughts were employed about the objects around her. She visited several convents, and found that solitude only eradicates some passions, to give strength to others, the most baneful ones. She saw that religion does not consist in ceremonies, and that many prayers may fall from the lips without purifying the heart. They who imagine they can be religious without governing the tempers, or exercising benevolence in its most extensive sense, must certainly allow that the religious duties are only practised from selfish principles. How then can they be called good? The pattern of all goodness went about doing good. Wrap up in themselves the nuns only thought of inferior gratifications. When the number of intrigues were carried on, to accelerate certain points in which their hearts were fixed, such as obtaining offices of trust or authority, or avoiding those that were servile or laborious. In short, when they could be neither wives nor mothers, they aim at being superiors, and became the most selfish creatures of the world. The passions that were curbed gave strength to the appetites, or to those mean passions which only tend to provide for the gratification of them. Was it their seclusion from the world, or did they conquer its vanities, or avoid its vexations? In these abodes the unhappy individual who, in the first paroxysm of grief, flies to them for refuge, finds too late she took her own step, the same warmth which, it a mean who will make her repent, and sorrow, the rust of the mind, will never have a chance of being rubbed off by sensible conversation or new born affection of the heart. She will find that those affections that have once been called forth and strengthened by exercise are only smothered, not killed, by disappointment, and that in one form or other, discontent will corrode the heart and produce those maladies of imagination for which they are no specific. The community at large Mary disliked, but pitied many of them whose private distresses she was informed of, and to pity and relieve were the same things with her. The exercise of her various virtues gave vigour to her genius and dignity to her mind. She was sometimes inconsiderate and violent, but never mean or cunning. End of chapter 13